Father God, we thank you so much for meeting with us here today. We just pray, Father, that you would speak loud and clear through your word. May your Holy Spirit take it and make it come alive in our minds and help us with the decisions that we need to make based upon your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen. amen. There's a lot of things that are in life that... Uh, I have the ability to purchase. And say, well, do you buy it? No, I only buy it if I'm willing to, right? There's a lot of times, as Americans, we don't have the ability to purchase it, but we want to, and we purchase it anyways, right? I mean, that's the American way. I can't afford it. Well, I'm getting it anyways. But in true life, to really purchase something, I'm not talking about using somebody else's, but in true life, if you're going to purchase something, you have to be able to do it, 
but you also have to be willing to also. There's, there's the capability part, and then there's the willingness part. There's two different mindsets that go along with ransoming or redeeming something. In this story, in the Bible, in the book of Ruth, we see come alive in these people's lives the story of God purchasing a bride for himself. And of course, these people are playing roles or types. Boaz is paying, playing the role or the type of Jesus Christ. Ruth is playing the role of the Gentile church, believers, like you and, you and I. And that bride has no business being in the promise. And how is she brought into the promise? Because Boaz, the near relative, has the ability to purchase her, to redeem back that which was sold, but also he's willing. He is in love with her. Remember, I sang a couple weeks ago, love is in the air. And that's what this story is about. Don't kid yourself. This isn't, this isn't people acting like robots and saying, well, the, the law says I better do this, so I better. No, no. He, the first time he laid eyes on, on uh, Ruth, he was like, oh, Lord, what are you doing here? Thank you for being such an awesome God. And remember, he instructed young men, you stay away from her. Now, the only reason for him to tell the young men to stay away from her is because he had design for her of his own. And Boaz plays the role of Jesus Christ. And as the near relative, to be this hero of the story, he had to not only be able to pay, but he had to be willing to pay, including all liens on the property. In 1 Peter, it says that Jesus Christ was the only one in this world that was able to pay the price for our sinful lives. See, when, when I sin, I create a debt to the law. I create a debt to the law. And, and God's law is not like today's financial system. See, in the world we live in, it's, it's, it's crazy. You can go out and all these credit card companies, they send you, send you these credit cards. I, I get them in the mail every week. I don't ask for them. They just come and say, Mr. Downs, we love you. And we have a card with your name on it, and we want you to use it like crazy. And so there's a lot of people that send, get these credit card love notes in the mail, and they just take them, and they use them, they run up, and then they're driving down the road, and they hear this radio commercial. Listen, are you in a lot of credit card debt because credit card companies have loved you too much? And you say, yeah. Well, listen, we have a way to where you don't have to pay it back. We can... We can just, you know, give them a sharp stick in the eye, and you can just go on your merry way getting other credit card companies to love you. Now, that's the way this world works. It doesn't work like that in God's world. When we violate God's law, it creates a debt. And what was the debt? The debt was of sin. The wage that we earn from it is, it, is death, separation from God, spiritually going dead to his influence in our life. And that debt cannot be repurchased by doing better. Someone else has to come and pay the debt. They have to be willing to pay. They have to be able to pay the debt. And to be able to pay that debt means they have to be sinless. They can't be in our condition. They have to be sinless and without a debt on their own. And so 1 Peter tells us, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold. We can't, with money, silver and gold, we can't purchase back a good standing with God. You can't. There's not enough gold, not enough silver in this world. But here's what's an adequate payment. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect, or blemish. Jesus was the only able payment for our violating God's law. And it's the only payment. That's the truth, that he is the only person to live a sinless life. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that we automatically get it paid for. Because the Bible says most people Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few go that way. Why? Well, here's the able part. God is not only 
His son, Jesus Christ, is not only willing, able to pay, but he's also willing to pay. That's what this story tells us about. The willingness of Boaz to pay the debt in our life. Now let's look at, first of all, in chapter 4, an official gathering. Remember, just to give a little backdrop, Ruth just so happened to land on Boaz's field, gleaning behind the reapers. He, the people harvesting the flocks, he sees her for the first time. Who is that? Oh, she's the, she's the Ruth, the Moabitess that came home with Naomi from, from Moab. And he said, hmm, he said, make sure a lot of stuff falls her way. And that was just the beginning of the story. She goes home to Naomi with all those quarts of grain that she got the first day of gleaning. She said, daughter, where did you go? Well, I was in Boaz's field. And she said, oh, Boaz's field? He's a near relative. This is a good deal. He could redeem us. He could, he could set us free from this poverty, from this situation that we're in. You don't go anywhere else. And so she continued going back to his field during the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, which was right on the heels of the barley harvest. Now, the interesting thing about this, this whole story takes place in just a few weeks' time. The whole book of Ruth in just a few weeks' time, other than Elimelech and his wife, uh, Naomi, going to Moab to live for 10 years. But man, when they came back to Bethlehem, it's just a few weeks' time, and their life is going to radically change. So remember, she kept going back to his field, and he kept loading her up, and she said, hey, he's down at the field harvesting and winnowing his, his uh, harvest. Why don't you go down there and let him know that you're willing to accept a marriage proposal? You're willing. And so she went down that night, did exactly what was told. He laid his cloak over her and said, in the morning, if this near relative won't purchase back the inheritance and take you, I will. And she went home that morning with a bunch of quarts of grain and I don't think Ruth nor Naomi slept much that night. Naomi said, how did it go, my daughter? She said, look at all the grain. He said he's going to go into town and do business. That's where we're at. Boaz is going to town. He's going downtown. And he's going to go to the county office and do business. Okay? And that's where we're at. Chapter 4, an official gathering. Verse 1, Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. And soon the family redeemer, Boaz had spoken about, the near relative than him, he came by. And Boaz called him by name and said, come over here and sit down. And so he went over and sat down. And then Boaz took ten men of the town's elders and said, sit here. And they sat down also. And he said to the redeemer, the relative that was nearer to him, <clears throat> nearer to Naomi than he was, he said, Naomi, who has returned from the land of Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to to our brother Elimelech. So why did they meet in the gate? The gate wasn't just this, like we think, just this one door. It was a long shaded tunnel that would lead from outside the city, Bethlehem, to inside the city. But Middle Eastern towns typically did not have large court, courtyards inside the walls to conduct business, so they would conduct business right in these shaded tunnels in the entrance to and from the towns. It was a prominent place for any kind of legal transaction because the men coming into town to do business, they would all pass by there. And, and so this was a place where a lot of those transactions would take place. The near relative comes by first. He calls him by name and says, come here and sit down. Uh, we got to do some business here. And then he collects 10 leaders of the city, 10 elders that are walking by, not a particular 10, but 10 Recognized men. And remember, Boaz would know these people because he was a very prominent man in the community, a wealthy man, the story told us. And so he would be very familiar with all these gentlemen. And he said, please sit down. We, we have some business to do. And these 10 men represent a quorum necessary for several things according to Jewish law. This quorum of 10 uh, men was necessary for a synagogue meeting. He could not have a legitimate synagogue a meeting of their uh, a religious meeting in the synagogue unless 10 men were present. Also, a marriage benediction or any other type of official business. There had to be 10 uh, male witnesses. And he said, now, now that he had the quorum there, he said very clearly, he said, this concerns the land that Naomi has sold. 
Now, I want to talk about that because in the English reading of it, it sounds like she is in the process of selling it. If she was in the process of selling it and it hadn't been done yet, then there would be no purchasing it back. It has already been sold. She probably did it uh, with, with Elimelech before they left town to go to Moab. Remember, they left town under the constraints of a famine. And so that means that you, you, know, you get rid of the least important stuff, and the last thing you get rid of is what? Your land. The last thing. And so she sold her land. But remember, nobody in Israel actually owned the land according to God. God owned the land. He gave it to them in trust to the 12 tribes. And remember, by lot, they, when they came into the land, every family got a portion of the promised land that they were to hold in the family name. And the law provided a couple things. The law provided this. If they were to fall on hard times and poverty would come their way and they would have to sell their land, it's not that we have such a concept of land ownership they would sell it, according to God's law, they would sell it only for its usage until the next year of Jubilee. So what was the next year of Jubilee? Every 50 years, according to God's law, the 50th year was called the year of Jubilee. No matter what happened during the previous 50, 49 years, in the 50th year, all the land was supposed to go back to the original family names. Because God owned the land, and they were just holding it in trust for him. Now, that's interesting, because according to history, Israel never once practiced the year of Jubilee. Why? Well, we just studied the year of Judges. And what was that? What was, what was everybody doing? They were doing what was right in their own eyes. So they were conducting business just like people in the world. Now think about this. How many times this has happened in our life? Our heart gets set on something. We know God's word says don't do that, but we'll are, well, my heart's set. I'm going to do what's in my eye rather than what God's word says. That's what the children of Israel were doing. And so that year of Jubilee thing didn't happen. That's why the story is so special. During the time of the judges, no one was living by the law. No one. So no one was holding the land in trust for the next year of Jubilee and it going back to the same people. They're like, oh, no, 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 you sold it. It's mine forever now. But that's not what God intended. God intended for the seed to be perpetuated in the land. Why? Because he had made certain promises to them. Certain promises to them. And what was the big promise that God made to Abraham? He said, Abraham, if you follow me, in this Genesis 12, if you follow me, I will make of you a great nation, and they will be so numerous, they will be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now, right now in Israel, there's about 7 million Jews that live there. I would not call that the stars of the sky nor the sand of the seashore, would you? That has not happened yet. Is God going to be faithful with his promise? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. When's that going to happen? It might happen pretty soon. But that's what God was concerned with, keeping his promise and keeping the seed. And so he gathers this official gathering and says, this concerns the land that Naomi sold. And then he then addresses the near relative to him. Uh, the theologians believe this was a brother to Elimelech. And he addresses him and he says, you have an obligation here. It says in verse 4, I thought I should inform you. Buy it back, purchase the land back, in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do so. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it and I am next after you. And the relative said, well, I want to redeem it, he answered. And you got it. I mean, put yourself in Boaz. He's like, he's making this, he's like, all right, now you gotta do the land. And if you're going to redeem it, he hasn't redeemed it so far. So maybe he's thinking, you know, he's not going to. If you plan on redeeming it, you got to do it because I'm next in line. And the guy goes, okay, I'll buy it. Okay. But he didn't tell him everything up front. He just talked about the land. The guy said, okay, I want to redeem it. So apparently, for the guy to say I wanted to redeem it, he had to be, say it with me, church, 
able to redeem it. Say it. He was able. He wouldn't say, yeah, I'm going to redeem it. Where's the money? Well, maybe I'll hit the lottery. No, no, no. That's not being able. I mean, he had the resources to do this. He said, all right, I'm going to redeem it. Then Boaz continued. He said, okay. Then Boaz said, I just want you to know, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also, require, you also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. Then the Redeemer replied, well, I can't redeem it myself or I will ruin my own inheritance. I'm not going to take that risk is what he said. Take my, go ahead and take my right of redemption because I can't redeem it. In other words, I'm not going to. He was able, but he wasn't willing. And at an early period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make a matter legally binding. Say, so what does that mean, Pastor? I have no idea. Because <laughs> I don't know why you would hand somebody your stinky sandal in order to bind a deal, but that's what they did, okay? In order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property, this was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, buy back the property for yourself. So let's look at what went down here. First of all, Boaz gets the official gathering together and he says, you have an obligation. If you will redeem it, go ahead. If not, I'm prepared and ready to. And he mentions only the land initially. And then after the guy said, okay, I'm willing to do it, then he brought up the matter of Ruth and her seed. Now, this was important. Remember, according to God's law, and Boaz, Boaz was a man of, of, of God, so he was doing it God's way. He was saying, now listen, if you buy the land, though, Ruth comes with the land and her seed. You don't get to own the land forever. You're holding it in trust for when she has a son. And when she has a son, you're basically purchasing it for him. You're buying it for him. You're doing this totally to keep the seed of Elimelech alive in the nation. And when he said, well, that's going to affect that's going to cost me. It's going to cost my inheritance. It's going to cost me, and I'm not going to get it forever. And he was like, right. He's like, well, I'm not willing to do that. Like the world, and this man, this near relative, he represents how the world looks at things. See, he was fine and dandy. He was totally willing to do it. When? He was willing if it wouldn't hurt him personally, or if he might gain for it and from it. He was like, Shoot, if I gain from this, if it doesn't hurt me, I'm all in. I'll buy it. When he says, well, you're going to hold it in trust for the, for the seed of Ruth. Oh, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking that risk. That's going to cost me personally. And they're going to be the beneficiary of it. No, nah, not going to do that. Only if it works out for me. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't look at things like that? Amen. See, if Jesus would have looked at things like that, he, he made his creation, he put us in a perfect spot, took care of all of our needs, and when we, when we blew it, he would have said, man, that's a shame, and went on and lived in his glory in heaven and just let man destroy himself. And man would have, right? Right? But instead, he says, oh, I got to redeem this situation. I got to fix it. Hey, son, are you willing to go and pay the price for these people so a seed can be saved? And his son said, I'll do your will, father. And God loved us so much that he was willing to pay even if it cost his own son's life in order to redeem that which was lost. And that's why Boaz is a picture of Christ. He said, if you're not willing, I am. I am. What drives a guy to do that? Love. 
<laughs> he loved her. And man, you know what guys say. Some of you are like, yeah, that love thing. Yeah, well, you weren't like that when you first started dating who you're sitting next to and you've been married for 30 years. Yeah, when you first started dating, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. We didn't calculate. We did. We were like, all in. I get her. Oh. Yeah, see, that's, that's what love does. Love makes you forget about the cost. The cost looks nothing compared to what is accomplished, right? Yeah. And that's the way Boaz is looking at it. And so they make an official announcement. In verse 9, it said, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, your witnesses today that I'm buying for Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilean, and Malon, the land, and I will also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to perpetuate the deceased man's name. Not my name, but his name on his property, so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his home. You are witnesses today. Boaz clearly states that he will redeem the land and the seed. Remember when she came home, when Ruth came home to Naomi after gleaning that first day, and Naomi was full of bitterness, and when she saw all those courts, she said, child, where did you go today? He says, well, I went to this guy's field, and he was really nice to me, and it went really well, and his name was Boaz. And she went, oh. And she went from bitterness to hope just like that. She said, he's an irrelative. In fact, he can not only redeem the living but the dead also. She said, he could not only take care of us, but he could perpetuate the name of Elimelech and my dead sons, too. He could do it all. He could fix it all if he's willing. He's capable. We're going to have to see if he's willing. The importance, it's kind of lost on us today, but the importance of perpetuating a seed was guaranteeing that their possession remained in Israel. Now, this was important because Israel, the promise, living in the promised land, was a symbol and a picture of God being faithful to his promise. If they lived outside the land, it what? It looks like God's not faithful. If they live in the land, it says, well, God's faithful. Why? Because he promised Abraham, this is yours. I'm going to give this to you as long as you obey me. Now, we live in interesting times. Because this nation rejected God and rejected his laws. And for almost 2,000 years, they got shoved out of the land and they were dispersed all throughout the world. And in quite spectacular fashion. It's the only time in the history of mankind this has happened to any people group. Not only did they retain their Jewishness, but they gathered back again in the same geographical spot as a nation again, and it happened last century. It happened in many of your lifetimes. And then went back into the land. Why? Because God is faithful to his promise. And them getting back in the land proves. Now think about this. There are 7 million Jews that live in Israel. They are surrounded by a billion Muslims that want to see them dead. And yet the billion can't kill the seven million. And they've been trying for years. Why can't the billion take care of the seven million? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, it's like us wondering whether or not we could defeat Cuba. That's like, don't even take a lunch with you. Our military would go over there, it would be a morning, after, morning activity, then come home, Cuba would be ours, right? It'd be a no-brainer. <laughs> over. But why can't the Muslims take over Israel? It's because God's not letting them. Amen. It's not that they don't have intention to. It's not that they don't teach their children to. It's not that they say, hey, this is our goal in life, to push them into the sea. 
Why can't they push that little nation in the sea of seven million people? Because God is protecting them. It's that simple, amen? Now, we should get excited about that. Why? Because he's not protecting them because they're good, nice people. He's not protecting them because they believe in him because they don't. He's protecting them because of his promise. His promise. And what did he say? What does he say in his word? We're going to get to the end of that. I can't jump to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> go backwards. All right. Let's stay right on track. Let's go to the next thing. Once he announces it, there's then an official benediction. There's the announcement. It says, verse 11, the elders and all the people, after he announces it, here's their response. Who were at the gate said, we are witnesses. I mean, you can tell that they've never seen this. It just blows their doors off. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah. That's the two wives of Jacob. They had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Epaphrath and famous, underline this, famous in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. I got to get historical here, not hysterical. I got to get historical here. Don't let me lose you. He says, first of all, they pronounce this benediction, this blessing on them and say, may your relationship with Ruth be like the wives of Jacob, Rachel and Leah, who bore all the sons. They're so blown away by Boaz following God's plan of redemption, they're like, oh, this is this beautiful thing, and they all get caught up in the moment. Isn't it true when you see people that love each other, you go to the wedding, you can just see when the groom sees the bride hit the door, and he's like, oh. And, and she's just in all her splendor and, and beauty, and, and they're standing there before their family and everything, and you just fall in love all over. You're like, oh, yeah, right? You're like, yeah, this is beautiful. It's wonderful. And you, you know, a lot of people meet at weddings and get married. Why? Because love is in the air. And encourages others to do the same. I met Cindy at a wedding. I was like, hmm, love. Yeah. A tall drink of water from California. <laughs> yeah, I was like, and man, it happens all the time. It's a great place. You be wedding crashers, young guys. Be wedding crashers. <laughs> go to weddings, crash them. You know, girls are all dolled up looking for somebody to go to the reception with them. I mean, crash. Now, he says, man, people just get caught up in it. They say, may you be blessed like Rachel and Leah. No one's saying, oh, she's a Gentile. They're saying, this is wonderful. And then, he says, make your house famous. In Bethlehem. Ah, and with that phrase, we find out what God's really after. Sometimes he puts, he puts these little phrases in there that just go, and you're like, oh, that's what this is about. Because we get caught up in the love story with Boaz and Ruth. I mean, yeah, love story, right? There's a bigger thing going on, way bigger thing. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? And God came to meet them that day, and they were all embarrassed and shamed. You know, they, they had the leaf covering or whatever. And he was like, oh, what'd you do here, Adam? And he said, it was the woman you gave. He blamed the woman. I mean, that, that's still going on today. And he said, Eve, what'd you do? He said, oh, it was the serpent. And remember what God said? God said, because of this, the serpent is going to bruise, bruise the heel of your seed, Eve. And the only death you die where your heels are bruised is crucifixion. As they work, move up and down the cross during crucifixion, the blood pools in the heels and their heels are black when they're buried. He says, you're going to do this to the seed, Satan. You're going to do this to the seed of Eve. You're going to bruise his heel. But he is going to bruise your head. He's going to crush you. 
That's what's going on here. And the one that was sent to crush the curse of Satan upon mankind was told in Scripture that he was going to come through the tribe of Judah, through the line of David. And these people just happened to live in Bethlehem. They just happened to be in the tribe of Judah. So what was really going on when Elimelech decided to go to Moab? Satan was at work trying to destroy the seed of the Messiah. That's really what was going on in the, during the period of Judges. Satan was trying to make it possible, impossible for Jesus to come as he promised he was going to come, through a certain tribe, through a certain family tree. He was trying to destroy all of them. So if he destroys the tree, the Messiah can't come. Because when the Messiah comes, he's going to buy back everything that was lost with our sin. Everything. And the enemy knows it. Satan knows it. He knows what's going on here. But we think so at the end of our nose, well, what am I going to do next weekend? What am I going to do with my next paycheck? What, I want to feel, I, I feel this way. I, we get so short-sighted. We don't think about what's going on with our children, our grandchildren, how that they can affect the future if we would just live sacrificially today, like Boaz. I think many Christians, they are much more like the other Redeemer, who said, yeah, I can afford it, but I'm not going to. It's all about me, baby. It's all about me. I'm not going to sacrifice and make a way. Now, Boaz and Ruth, they have no idea what's going on here. They're just living obedient lives. But God's going after big things. And that's why Tamar was mentioned. The mention of Tamar, who was also another Canaanite Gentile, who began the line of Judah when he slept with this Canaanite woman. And she gave birth to Perez, the son of Judah. And that reminds us that God's desire was not just to fulfill his promises to Israel, but to Gentiles too, to include all men. Remember what he said to Abraham? I'm going to bless all the world through your seed, Jew and Gentile alike. I'm going to bless the whole world. And we see this in the very family tree of Jesus Christ. And why was this all possible? Because he loves her. He loves her with grace and favor because of his loving kindness. Not because she did something to earn it, and here's my new favorite Hebrew word that is only found in the book of Ruth. It's the Hebrew word, cheez-it. <laughs> because my favorite snack is cheez-its. And so I will never forget that Hebrew word, and it means God's loving kindness. He just chose. He looks at us and he says, oh, I love them. That's why God sent his son. I love them. Not because there was something lovable about us, but because he made a decision. And he acted upon it. And I went fast through all that so we could get to the conclusion. And what's the conclusion? Simply, may we run to Jesus for soul safety. It's the only place to find safety for our soul. But I want to go over to Hebrews in closing. Because Hebrews is like the gospel for the Jews. It was a book written to Jewish believers. And what it did was it helped them bridge... The Old Testament, all the things they used to do with the priest and the temple and the sacrifices and how that was all gone in the church. And they didn't bring animal sacrifices there and, and, and it would just fry a Jew's mind. Now, wait a second. I, this can't be right. I have to do this. And then, no, 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 no. Jesus was the fulfillment of all that. And so Hebrews was written to help them bridge that gap between what they practiced growing up and what the reality was in the New Testament age, the age in which we live in. And I want to read this portion of Hebrews chapter 6 because I want you to underline a couple things. It says in verse 17, because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise. He guaranteed it with an oath. He took a vow. So that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, so those are the two things. God's promises are true. We can trust him. We can trust what he says based on two things. Number one, 
the character of God. It's impossible for him to lie. And he backed that up. He swore. And he backed it up. So when we swear, when we say, oh, I promise, you know, we'll say, I promise on, on this, on my mother's honor. What you're saying is your mother's honor is greater than your honor. So you're swearing on her honor. And we, when we swear, we don't say, I swear by that bum that lives on the corner. We swear by something greater than us, right? And so God swore and took a vow. Since nothing's greater than him, he said, I swear on myself. Because there's none greater than him. I swear based upon who I am and the fact that I cannot lie that I will fulfill my promises to you. And I'm not going to change. Nothing's going to change that. And then he goes in and he says three things. He says, to those we who have fled for, underline this, refuge, might have strong encouragement to seize the hope that is before us. We have this hope as, second thing, anchor of our lives, safe and secure. It enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a, here's the third thing, forerunner, because he has become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, verse 25 says, Therefore, because this is true, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. It doesn't say he saves some. He's always able. He saves everyone that comes because of these three things. The first thing it said in Hebrews, the first thing it said was that he was a refuge. He was a refuge. Now, the Jews would understand this because when they went into the Promised Land, they designated six cities as cities of refuge. And so if you killed someone, let, let's say you had a neighbor over and you guys were cutting some trees down and the axe handle, the axe head flew off the handle and hit that guy in the head and you killed him. His family would want to take vengeance on you, but it wasn't your fault. It's called what? Manslaughter. You slaughtered a man. You didn't do it by intention. You could go live in a city of refuge and you would be safe there. Let me tell you, we were born sinners. It was not our fault. But that curse passed upon us by birth. We came out of the womb sinners. We were created, as David said, I was born in my I was formed in my mother's womb, cursed because of what Adam and Eve did. That curse passed upon all men. And Jesus is the only refuge. Secondly, it says that he's an anchor, safe and secure. Uh, if you put your anchor, what's a boat anchor do? A boat anchor holds the boat safe during a storm. So the wind doesn't move it, the waves don't move it, it holds it secure. And if you put the anchor of your life in your job, you might say, oh, you don't understand. My job is so secure. <laughs> really? I mean, does anybody say that anymore? People used to say that. Now you're like, no, that's not, that's not a place. Or how about this? We have government health now. It's in our health cards. There's my anchor. Let's put it in our health card. Federal government insurance. Oh, I'm so safe. They can't even get, I, I, I don't know what side of the bed they wake up on every day, but it's typically the wrong side. Okay. I mean, you can't be more behind the curve than the federal government is, can you? I mean, they're like, the ball is in the pitcher, is in the catcher's mitt, and they're like. <laughs> right? That's not a place to put your anchor or your pension or your bank account. All those things, we know they can poof the magic dragon in a moment. But he says, our anchor is not here, not in the deepest ocean, not in the strongest uh, makeup of something man can do. He said, our anchor is in the heavenlies, in the throne room of God behind the curtain. Now, that's important because behind the curtain was where the glory of God dwells in the holies of holies. 
And the third thing, it said that Jesus was a forerunner. He went in there ahead of us. Now this, once again, a little history. In the Old Testament, when the high priest would go into the holies of holies where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt, back there, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was, the mercy seat, the cherubim on top, and the Ark contained the law, the things that condemned us, and the the high priest would go in there behind the curtain once a year. They would tie a rope around his waist in case he went in there with unconfessed sin because he would immediately die and they'd drag him out. Because no man could enter into there except the high priest, and he wouldn't go in alone. He would first, in the inner temple, he would first sacrifice a lamb, take the blood of that lamb, and sprinkle it ahead of him when he went in there so that every place that his foot walked in the presence of the glory of God, there would be blood between his foot and the glory of God. Everywhere. And then he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and then what? He would hightail it out. He did not spend a lot of time in there. Because why? He was afraid of the holiness of God. But he says, Jesus Christ, though, he did what the high priest could not do. The high priest did that every year, every year, once a year, once a year, to appease for the sins of the whole nation, he went in there. But he could never take anyone with him. Never. But history tells us the day that Jesus Christ died, the curtain separating the glory of God from sinful man, the curtain was torn in two because Jesus took us there with him. He took us, he made it possible for us sinners to be in the presence of a holy God by his sacrifice, by his own blood. Yeah. And why did he do that? Because he loves us. He was willing. The disciples tried to talk him out of it. Don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you. He said, they're not going to kill me. They're not going to take my life. I'm going to lay it down. Why would we refuse such a place to be safe? Why? Why? It's deer hunting season, isn't it? All the guys are gonna go get, gonna go get them. Right now it's bow season, right? When's the guns? Oh, see, they know. They know. Next Thursday. You already got their deer stands up. We put a deer licky thing in our backyard. Why, you want to kill it? No, we want to take pictures. Has it worked so far? The squirrels sit on it. No deer yet. We put one of the eating ones with the like ground up grains and stuff like that. It's, it's like this block. I paid like 20 bucks for it. To put up there, Bambi will come, we can take pictures. Now the squirrels ate that gone. Two days, they were like, thank you, God. <laughs> Why squirrels will have a great winter. Great winter. But man, what are you going to do? Man, the reason deer hunting season is this time of year is because bucks love does. The bucks don't come out of the woods unless it's that time of year. Where doe, the does are like, hey, big fella, let's make some little deers. And the big bucks, they come out of the woods. <laughs> they never come out. Why? Because they know you get dead when you come out. But they're like, oh, they come walking right out. Why? Because they're in love. They're in love. The deers get it. Why don't we get it? Jesus loved us so much. He left heaven, came to this earth, gave his life for us. How can you refuse that? How can you refuse that? It's, I mean, it's a done deal. It's the only safe place for your soul. Amen? Amen. Provided by Jesus Christ, the one who loves you. Let's stand to our feet this morning. We will rise. 
Yeah.